Welcome to Regeneration Life Church. Thursday night, special topic, but tonight on a Wednesday night, and not a special topic, it is actually our ongoing series in Jude. Okay, so hopefully I've got all of the brain trips out of the way where I trip over my brain. I'm not referring to anything else. Uh, this is Ancient Antinomianism Repackaged Part 1. Huge problems. Jude 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we're on the subject of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, I need to spend uh, some time on this topic. As we are talking about modern false doctrines. Now this is a false doctrine of salvation that in effect turns the grace of God into lascivious slash sediousness. Okay? Now, before I go into this, I want to point out that there are otherwise righteous people who for some reason are bewitched and err on this doctrine. Okay? The message here is a refutation of modern antinomianism, which is a term coined by Martin Luther, and it means without law, which is the ancient heresy that said that all you had to do was believe, and by that they meant intellectual agree, and you were freed from every law and moral code, including the commandments of God. By the way, the word antinomianism, as I said, is without law. The word iniquity also means without law. We will be refuting here what is known as the Free Grace Movement, whose title is a misnomer, as I'm sorry to say. It is simply ancient antinomianism relabeled with a more biblical-sounding brand. Now, some may argue that the Free Grace Movement is different from antinomianism because most Free Gracers don't actually advocate unholy living, although I have met some that do. And classical antinomianisms uh, actually encouraged Sin, So they say, well, it's different because we don't encourage sin. Well, in a way, in a roundabout way, going through the back door, yes, you do. Okay? Um, the ancient antinomianisms would actually encourage sin so that grace could increase. That's the difference. Now, the problem is, is that these teachings are so close together that they're almost indistinguishable. And so what free grace actually is, is... Functional antinomianism. They essentially say that the moral laws of God do not matter in your salvation. Now, before I continue, we know that our works do not matter when it comes to being saved. You cannot be saved by your works. We know that. But the whole thing about just intellectually agree that Jesus died on the cross and you're saved is nonsense. It is nonsense. Jesus, we're going to go into a lot of scriptures here, that, that show that it's nonsense. But Jesus essentially was telling people that it is because of their antinomianism, their, their iniquity, that he didn't know them. Now, when somebody does go to their pastor being under conviction that they're living in sin, the antinomian pastor might say something like, oh, you shouldn't doubt your salvation. Don't worry about your salvation. Nah, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You should obey God. But it doesn't matter because you're not saved by works. But in reality, what you should be doing is telling a person to repent and get right with God. Now, I'm going to give something from my own life. And I was freshly born again. And I asked spiritual counselor of a relative. And this is about 25 years ago. I asked questions about what it meant to be a Christian. And I told his relative that the Bible commands, or what the Bible commands, and I asked, are you saying I don't have to do that? Her exact words were, well, you should. And she went on to explain that you said the prayer, you're okay. You should do all that, but if you don't, you know, you're just not as far into your walk as those that do. Free grace proponents... <coughs> actually say that no change in your inner man or behavior is necessary for salvation. 
The antinomians of the first century taught the exact same thing. The free grace movement teachers have said verbally and in books that it doesn't matter if your faith produces change in your inner being, and it doesn't matter if it leads to a changed life or not. Just like under the classical antinomian heresy, the free grace version of it actually says one is essentially free to live like the devil and still be saved as long as you believe, and again they mean intellectually agree, with the basic facts of the gospel that Jesus died and resurrected and that he lived and you just believe. And this is not a false witness, folks, and this is not a stretch of their teachings. They don't believe in repentance. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit changes you. Uh, there doesn't have to be any godly desire that takes place inside you at all. You don't have to... You don't have to do anything except repeat a prayer, which, by the way, is a work, just so you know. The sinner's prayer should be a heart cry to God. The sinner's prayer should be a reflection of something that has taken place inside you already, the, the, the faith that has entered your heart. The sinner's prayer is that confession unto salvation, right? But what does it have to be? It has to be based on a heart that has believed under righteousness. Okay, and you, you look at, at Romans 10 for that. And they also say that you can, at some point in time, if you've said this prayer, you can completely turn against Jesus Christ and you're still saved. Because there was a time that you believed in Jesus Christ and intellectually agreed that he died on the cross. Their theology should not be called free grace. As it redefines the biblical truth of grace and the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die so that you could go and live according to your own will. Jesus didn't die so that you could live like the devil and still be deceived into thinking you're saved. Well, where do you get that, Pastor? What are you saying, Pastor? Are you advocating works, Pastor? Hold on just a second. Let me show you. You should have known I'd have been prepared. Titus 2, 11 through 14. In passages like this are where I get it. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's the teaching of grace. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Lawlessness, antinomianism, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Get this, zealous of good works. See, works do not save you. They are an outgrowth of your salvation. The grace that saves teaches self-denial and holiness. We slip, we fall, but that is the goal. That is the teaching of grace. That is how we should live. And Jesus died to redeem, purify, and cause a desire to obey and do good works. The free grace, antinomian set of beliefs were defined by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1937 as cheap grace. Yes, the only way to heaven is to believe in Jesus, but true belief in Jesus causes a change in the person. Repentance and good works accompany this change. Repentance and good works are fruit of this change. God changing you and making you want to do the will of God is not legalism. It's the very opposite of legalism. Legalism says do this to get saved. We know that that's a false gospel. But it's equally false to say that true faith doesn't change you. That is equally false and equally bewitching. There are five huge problems, folks, with the free grace version of antinomianism. Number one, it turns the grace of God into lasciviousness by making people think that the grace of God allows lasciviousness. So that you can live however you want and still be safe. Look at this. Jude 4 again. I'm going to go back to it. Jude 4. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. But everyone sins, they counter. Yes, you are right. Everyone sins, but there are major differences. Number one, there is a difference between an archer striving to hit the mark and missing and one who just shoots the arrow any place he wants to. Because we all sin anyway. 
I'm just going to shoot. I know the target's over there. I'm going to shoot over here. Because you know why? We're all going to miss. That's iniquity. Number two, there's a difference between committing a sin and knowing you're wrong and not wanting to do it again and committing a sin or worse, living in sin and thinking it's no big deal because you are saved by grace or you are under grace. Oh, I'm under grace, so you know what? It really doesn't matter if I go out and do X, Y, and Z. It doesn't matter. I'm under grace. It's okay. That's iniquity. And three, while real, real Christians do fail, real Christians do fall, real Christians do big pieces of stupid, real Christians do some pretty bad things, and we admit to it. But what's the attitude? If you believe God's commands are for you, but you fought and you failed, and you sinned, go to Jesus for grace. Go get you some grace. That's why it's there. That's why Jesus died for you. But if you don't believe God's commandments are for you, that is iniquity. Why would you go for forgiveness at that point if you don't believe that they're for you anyway? That's lawlessness. That, my friends, is antinomianism. The second problem, the second problem here with free grace version of antinomianism. By saying that the Spirit of God does not change you when He enters. The free grace version of antinomianism is a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3.5 Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This free grace form of antinomianism allows for all of the things God calls evil in 2 Timothy. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. What about all those thou shalt not inherit? What about those? Shall not inherit. Did God slip of the tongue there? Did he mean to say that? Was that Paul just, whoops, the pen just got away from me? No, it's not. Those are things that you should never do if you are truly born again. And if you live in them, if you continue in them, now you can say, oh, well, I failed in, in one of these. Okay, you failed in one of them. Go get grace. Go to God. Go to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Go, go to Jesus, your, your attorney before the, God the Father. Go to Him. Yes, absolutely. But you are not to live in them. That is not your lifestyle. Number three, third problem. Free grace tells people what they want to hear. You can be saved, and you don't have to change anything. Ah, you can have your sin in Jesus too. So you never have to worry about hell again. You said, you repeated after the pastor, didn't you? Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, well, you know, what does it matter? You're in Christ. That's the message. 2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now I've said this before. The shepherds, when they would be out with the sheep, and there would be bugs, flies, flying around the sheep's head. There were two ways to handle that. Number one was to anoint the sheep's head with oil. It's a representation of the Holy Spirit and a representation of the Word. It's a representation of godliness. And the other way is to scratch the sheep's ears. And we got bells above the Lord of the Flies putting all sorts of thoughts in our head. So how are you going to handle it? Are you going to scratch the itching ears or are you going to apply the Holy Spirit? Think about it. The, the belief, the, the itching ears belief allows for every heresy and evil act imaginable if one just does nothing more than believe. And again, what they mean is intellectually agree. That's how you end up with Christian blasphemers. That's how you end up with Christian drug dealers. That's how you end up with Christians who get drunk and shake their barely covered bodies on the weekends. That's how you end up with Christian strippers. That's how you end up with Christian porn stars. That's right, I said, and I'll say it again. 
Christian porn stars. You don't think that there are people out there who are in that industry who don't think they're Christians because somebody said, hey, you said a prayer and you're saved? I got news for you. They're there. As a matter of fact, there's an entire company that calls itself a Christian pornography company. Oh, how about this? How about this? Christian murderers. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who defended themselves and accidentally killed somebody. I'm not talking about that. That's not murder. I'm talking about people who actually have gone out and committed premeditated murder, but they said, oh, it's okay, I'm going to prison. But you know what? I'm still saved. I won't go to hell. Now, I was in a Sunday school lesson where someone said, and I quote, you can even commit murder and be saved. You'll take your salvation to prison with you, but you won't lose it. End quote. When I dared to ask, what do you do with the scripture in 1 John that says, No murderer hath eternal life abiding in him? The place exploded. In biblical terms, it caused no small stir. It was just a question. Well, you need to understand that the context here is hating a brother, brother, which I informed the class that only made my point stronger. I was then informed in a very loud manner that I clearly didn't know the Bible. And when I said, with humility, that I hold multiple seminary degrees, well, then the story changed, and I was then informed that I guess they thought, I guess I thought I was better than them. Very strange how, no matter what I do, I'm wrong, because I upset the apple cart in that little temperamental church. That's what happens in Bible studies with free grace people when you dare to ask a question about that golden calf. Uh-oh, did I call it golden calf? Yes, I did. Did I mean it? Yes, I did. Will I repent? No, I won't. I was accused of ignorance and then arrogance when I defended the charge of ignorance. I was yelled at. I was given the evil eye. And when I say I was given the evil eye, I mean I was given multiple evil eyes by multiple people. I was given the look of death. If looks could kill, I'd have been dead 20 times over. And then the Bible teacher sat there slack jawed, didn't know what to do or say. Why? Because I asked them a question about murder. And they couldn't answer it. I finally just calmed myself down, gathered my Bible, gathered my things, wished them well, stood up, and walked out of that of that. Bible study, leaving the carnality smoldering behind me. Why? Because somebody dared to say that you can go and kill somebody if you're a Christian, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're still saved. It doesn't matter. Now, here's the thing. I believe that, that once you have attained salvation, you can't lose it. But I, here's the thing. Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit later, too. That doesn't mean that you don't have to persevere. And those two are not mutually exclusive. Those two are not a dichotomy. Those two are not opposed to each other, and I'll show you scriptures proving it. Here's the thing, okay? If you are a Christian, you are not going to commit murder. Could you kill somebody if they're attacking you or your family accidentally? Yes, you can. That's not the same as murder, that's self-defense. Let's move on. The fourth problem with the free grace movement, it calls saved what Jesus called children of the devil. People Jesus called children of the devil, again, the free grace movement would call saved because they believe. Let's look at John 8, 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples in me, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Did these Jews which believed on him continue in his word? No, they didn't. They argued with Jesus himself. And then, when we see that in John 8, 31 through 42, read it. And then, these Jews that believed on him sought to kill him. And that's John 8, 40. These Jews that believed on him insulted him. John 8, 41, Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. That was a sarcastic reference, by the way, to his virgin birth. As the Jews had been saying that Jesus was an illegitimate bastard child instead of virgin born. 
We be not born of fornication. Right? That's like saying, well, I'm not the one who blah, 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 blah. Think about it. So were these Jews that, quote unquote, believed on him saved? The free grace movement would answer with an emphatic and resounding yes, because these Jews believed on him. That's what the scripture said. But Jesus says this, ye are of your father, the devil. Jesus also called tares that had been planted in the church that were not actually Christians. Yes, here's another thing, the problem with antinomianism. There are people that Jesus said would be planted in the wheat field of God. There are poisonous plants that look like wheat. And Jesus said they are children of the wicked one. Folks, if you're not born again, please get born again. Don't be one of those religious people that just goes to church and causes problems and lives in sin. Please don't be that. I want you saved. I'm not condemning you. I, am, I have nothing but a heart of love for you. I want you in heaven. I'm not going to bend the word. I'm not going to do anything else to the word. I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it. I am not going to preach some watered down garbage and then let you think that you're saved when you're actually being deceived. I want you in heaven. You see my heart. I am not being condemnatory. I'm trying to preach the word. I want you saved. And according to the free grace movement, these Jews that quote unquote believed in Jesus were saved because they believed in Jesus. So who's right? The free grace antinomianists or Jesus? They say he's saved. Jesus said they weren't. They said these people were saved. Jesus said they weren't. Number five, the free grace movement does not recognize the right of Jesus to command them. Jesus has a threefold right to command you. First of all, he's God. He has the right to command you. Number two, he is the creator. So he has the right to command you. Number three, he has the right as the redeemer who bought you with a price. And these people will say that you can accept Jesus as Savior that you don't have to accept him as Lord. And then they denigrate you by saying you preach lordship salvation if you point out that Jesus is Lord and you need to bow the knee. The bad news for that false doctrine is that the very word Christ literally means Savior King. It doesn't just mean Savior. Christos, Mashiach, Two words, different language, same word, different languages. It means Savior, King. But you can be a citizen of a kingdom and still hate the law, somebody told me. Well, that's only when the king of the kingdom is not all-knowing, but Jesus is all-knowing. He knows your heart. Okay, the people that live in sin, they like to go, well, God knows my heart. Yeah, he does know your heart, and you better be afraid. It must be noted here that the free grace people misrepresent those who hold my view as teaching a works-based salvation. That is a misrepresentation. Or lordship salvation. Let me tell you something. That is either one of two things. That is either a lie coming from carnality or a lie coming from the devil himself. We teach that once you're born again by the Holy Spirit's power, he changes you. He makes Jesus your Lord. He gives you the desire to turn from sin. And He gives you the desire to obey the Lord. But what about someone who's struggling with sin? The free grace person would ask me and did ask me. The response, the answer is in the question. He is struggling. No one said that a baby Christian or even one who is maturing in the faith automatically becomes a 100% solid, mature Christian who never has to worry about sin, who has it all under control, who rarely slips and falls because you'll never be sinlessly perfect. I don't care what those groups tell you. You will never, ever experience sinless perfection this side of going to heaven, this side of the kingdom. You won't do it. But who says that, that this person 
Okay? Who says that, that, that this person is automatically going to become a mature Christian? None of us do. There are people who are baby Christians who have been baby Christians for 20 years and you need to get yourself right. But they have been struggling. They struggle and they continue and they struggle and they persevere and they struggle and they go. That's the point. Struggle. That's the word. Struggle. That's the key. Struggle. They're struggling against sin. The point here is that there is a change that makes him or her sorry for his or her sin, and they want to change. It isn't our works, folks. It's his. We cannot be saved by our works. We are saved by Christ's works. His free gift of grace isn't just forgiveness of sin, but the gift of the Holy Spirit to change the new believer into a new creature. When the free grace people say that we chase people away, it shows clearly that they don't know that Jesus himself turned away multitudes in droves by not committing to them and giving them hard truths that the natural mind could not and did not accept. What does God do? What does God do when he saves someone? First of all, ladies and gentlemen, he writes his law on that person's heart. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. For those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This, ladies and gentlemen, the context of this is a description of the new covenant which we now live in. God gives them, <clears throat> those that are born again, a new spirit that causes them to want to obey. We've already touched on this. But we can look at another scripture in Ezekiel 11, 19 through 20. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I shall be their God. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 also repeats this. And God is immutable. He doesn't change. This is his goal. God in Acts 15, 8 through 9 says this. And God which knoweth their hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did on, uh, unto us. This is, okay, this is talking, uh, a Jews talking about Gentiles. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Jew and Gentile, it's the same gospel. Romans 7, 4 says this, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that he should bring forth fruit, or that ye, we, rather, should bring forth fruit unto God. Colossians 1, 12-14, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How can you be in a kingdom if you don't recognize the king? How can you be delivered from darkness yet still walk in darkness? Titus 2.14, speaking of Jesus, gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify into himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus 3.3-5, 3, 3 for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. How can you be renewed and regenerated and stay the same foolish, disobedient, deceived, lust and pleasure-serving, malicious, envious haters? Can you slip? Yes, you can. Absolutely. You will fight it. But you know what? You don't live in those things if you were born again. First Peter 1 2 says this We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Ephesians 2 1 shows that the spiritually dead are resurrected in spirit, and you have the quickened, 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 
who were, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We have an old nature. It was controlled by the devil. Ephesians 2.2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We were children of wrath by nature, Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, mm -hmm. even as others. But the Holy Spirit, through grace and faith in Jesus Christ, has changed us if we are in the faith. We get a new life. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. So we get a new life. We get a new position. Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there's a new position. There is a new future. <clears throat> new future, Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Not by anything we have done, but by what he has done. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't stop there. Ephesians 2.10 shows that the evidence of God's work in us is our work in Him. So you're not saved by works, but you are saved unto works. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is a package deal, folks. You cannot have any of this without taking it all. It is a change that happens in the person who has true faith. <clears throat> I want to look rather, excuse me, <clears throat> I want to look here at six of the most dangerous free grace movement claims that contradict scripture. Now I don't have time to go into all of the false beliefs of these people, so I've chosen what I consider to be the six most dangerous. False belief number one, salvation does not require any change inside of you. It's kind of a we're going to go into a Christian Mythbusters segment here. How could you not be changed? If the spirit, which was, which your spirit, which was dead in transgressions and sins, has been resurrected by the Holy Spirit, how can you not be changed? You are a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. This is not figurative. This is literal. You have been resurrected in your spirit if you're born again. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You have had your spirit that was dead in transgressions and sins resurrected. You were changed into the image of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hello, somebody. They say, modern day antinomianists, the free grace movement says you don't change. You don't have to change. Well, here we are. Here's a look at scripture <clears throat> that says you do change. How can they say that faith doesn't change you? Faith, false belief number two, salvation is easy. Chuck Swindoll, and, and let me tell you something, I have a lot of respect for him. I use his commentary, see, he has a lot of good things to say. But he said something a few years ago that really rattled my cage. He said uh, that he responds to references when somebody talks to him about easy believism with a question. What is hard believism? And he said nobody's answered him. Well, I have the answer for you, Dr. Swindoll. Matthew 7 holds that answer. So let's look at Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few be there that find it. Sounds like hard believism. Free grace antinomianists 
lead people down the broad path by making salvation easy when Jesus said to strive to enter and few be there that find it. We have to get born again. Jesus said, ye must be born again. What is being born again? It's regeneration. It's spiritual resurrection. You have to go there. That has to be what happens to you. You have to call upon the name of the Lord in full assurance of faith and repentance. And we're going to get into that in a minute. These people forget the context of calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, I don't have the scripture, my bad. They forget the context of calling on the name of the Lord in Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. I didn't put it on this, I apologize. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you know where calling upon the name of the Lord comes from? It is from a heart that has already believed unto righteousness. It is not a religious work that you do to get saved. Repeating. after The pastor's like, if you want to get saved today, well just repeat after me. The sinner's prayer should be the cry of a reborn heart to God. Not anything else. Not some kind of work. You know, all you got to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Oh, really? You've got to call upon the name of the Lord. Really? Okay, I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord. And you know what? I, I there's, some, uh, there's some stuff going down over here. I'm going to go take a look at what's going on there. I'm not going to change anything, but I've called upon the name of the Lord, so I'm saved, right? Uh-huh. All right. Seriously? You better read the whole scripture. It says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. You can't have a confession that is made into salvation if you don't first have a heart that is believed unto righteousness. Hello, somebody. False belief number three, repentance is not necessary for salvation. I'm going to string together a string, a pearl necklace for you right now to prove to you that repentance is required, that the scripture is not, is, is not hard to understand on this point. Okay? So here we go. Repentance is not necessary for salvation, they say. That's false belief number three. Repentance is unto salvation, says 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Hello, somebody. To salvation, not to be repented of. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, Pastor. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. How do you miss it? It's in there. It's right there. Here's looking at something else. Acts 11, 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto what? Life. Repentance unto life. The reason for repentance is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 3, 2, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hello, somebody. Luke 5.32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to a pool party, to a pizza dinner, to repentance. I come to call the sinners to repentance. Why if it's not important? Why does a sinner have to repent if it's not important? Then there's repentance delivers from spiritual death. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish. Hello, somebody! Not willing that any should perish! But that all should come to repentance. Oh, that's just talking about physical death. You better take a look again at the context. There's a second death, too. It's not just the first death of this body. The second death is being cast into the lake of fire. This is what it's talking about. This is talking about eternal life. Repentance is the foundation of our faith. Hebrews 6.1 Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance to dead works. There is joy in heaven. For a sinner, a single sinner who repents. Luke 
15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Why, if it doesn't buy you salvation, why throw a party in heaven? What good is it? If, it does, if repentance is not part of the faith that saves you from eternal damnation. I love somebody. Repentance is important. As a matter of fact, it's God's will for salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's the opposite of perishing? Repentance. It's setting up a dichotomy here. It's setting up an opposite here. Okay? Without repentance, there's perishing. God commands repentance of all men, Acts 17.30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Jesus commands the preaching of repentance, Luke 24.47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus said to preach repentance. False belief number four. You don't have to bear fruit. In fact, they say that you can be a true Christian and never bear fruit. They call the belief that you must bear fruit works-based salvation. That's ridiculous. That's ludicrous. John 15, 5-6, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The person that abides in Christ bears fruit. The person that does not bear fruit is cast into the fire. You cannot get any clearer than this. And yet they try to twist these words. It is the nature of the apple tree to bear apples. It is the nature of a pear tree to bear pears. You don't plant an apple tree expecting bananas. If you do, you will be very disappointed. If the free grace people are right, and a Christian does not have to bear fruit, then what do they do with Matthew 7, 18-20? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring, bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. This is not, not in any way, shape, form, or fashion about earning your salvation through works, ladies and gentlemen. Just like it is the, it is the nature of the apple tree to bear apples and the pear tree to bear pears, and the orange tree to bear oranges. It is the nature of the Christian to bear godly fruit out of the new nature. False belief number five. You can believe in Christ as Savior, yet reject Him as Lord. Essentially, you can become a Christian and still live in rebellion, shaking your fist at the Lord who died for your salvation. You can accept His gift and still reject Him. You can become a Christian and still live in rebellion against Him, just like the devil, because you said a prayer. You believed at one point in time. Yay! Hebrews 5 9 says this. And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. You are bearing fruit for the kingdom if you're born again. And that fruit is obedience. Let's look at Luke 19, 27. But those mine enemies which not... And this is Jesus talking. I'm not making this up. This is a kingdom parable. It's right in front of you. Well, let me go here. I forgot to do that. I'm sorry about that. Well, apparently your pastor forgot to put this scripture in there too. Bad pastor. Bad pastor. Luke 19, 27 says this. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. In that same parable, Matthew said uh, that 
and it's and probably he said both, and it's one recorded one part and one recorded another. But Jesus indicated that they would be uh, cast into the lake of fire. They would be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then we have Matthew 21 through 23. Again, I forgot to put it. Well, maybe I didn't. Nope, that's Matthew 13. Okay. Matthew 20, uh, 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness, iniquity, antinomianism. And then there's false belief number six. You can even turn your back on the Lord because you believed on Him at one point in time and you'll keep your salvation. You can denounce Christ and become a malignant atheist and apostate and you can still be saved. I confess, I, I put it to you folks, that a person's never saved to begin with. I'm going to keep the scriptures. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, with you've been truly saved, that you have been resurrected on the inside. You have A miracle has taken place inside you. God's Holy Spirit has come to live inside you. If you've been truly born again, you cannot lose it. But I, And I spent two sessions in this church a few months ago going through multiple scriptures trying to prove it to you. But to say that you can come to Christ and then denounce Him and even go full atheist is not what the Bible says. And I do have this scripture, Matthew 13, 20 through 23. But he that receiveth the seed in his stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Hath not hath he not root in himself? It hasn't taken root. But dureth for a while. In other words, he, he got he essentially got religious and endured for a while. He didn't get saved. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by, he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he become unfruitful. But he that receiveth, and that, that person is not saved either. Remember, you have to bear fruit. Jesus was clear in both Matthew and John that if you are truly a Christian, you are a fruit tree. But he that receives seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Some people are going to bear more fruit than others, but we're all going to bear some fruit. Listen to me. The word shows that if you fall away, you are never saved. And I'm not talking about a Christian that goes prodigal and messes up and has to get right with God. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who turn their back on the gospel. Turn their back on Jesus. People who have completely, they never repent because they were never saved. Somebody asked me, well, what's the difference between a Christian who, who falls into sin and somebody who just got, who's a religious unbeliever, essentially? Okay? Repentance. That's the difference. Repentance is feeling sorry for your sin and not wanting to do it anymore. That's it. That's godly sorrow. It's the very definition. But if you fall away, if you turn your back on the Lord, you were never saved. Hebrews 3, 6 says this. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Hebrews 3, 14 has a similar statement. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So essentially, you're a Christian right now. You're a born-again believer right now if you endure to the end. 1 John 2.19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. We see clearly... It is they who persevere unto the end that are saved. If you persevere to the end, then, whether it's when Jesus comes back or your own life, you are saved today. 
But if you do not persevere in the faith, you are never saved. It's not me saying it. I just showed you the scriptures. God is an eternal God. He knows the end from the beginning, people. Lifelong perseverance in the faith is a fruit of salvation. It is a fruit of a change that has taken place. Matthew 24 and 13. <clears throat> he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now next session, we're going to be looking at scriptures that, that have to be used out of context and twisted. We will look at the beliefs of the modern day antinomianists in light of many of the words of Jesus, Paul, Peter, James, John, and Jude. And we will end with some questions that the free grace movement cannot answer next week. I'm going to conclude part one of this lesson by saying this. The preaching, the message that the Holy Ghost produces a change in you at the point of salvation and that causes you to want to serve God and to want to do the works of God and to want to learn about God and to want to do all of these things, zealous of good works, remember that. Doing the will of God from the heart, remember that. That's not legalism. It is the whole point of the doctrine of spiritual regeneration that you were changed, that God changes you. It is not by our works, it is by His work in us that makes us the way He intended us to be, which is to serve Him. That is the furthest thing from legalism. The opposite is actually true. The free grace antinomianists are the ones preaching the itching ears message. They are the ones watering down the gospel, helping Satan plant tares in God's wheat field by preaching the false gospel. The gospel changes you. There are too many scriptures saying that if you truly believe, there is a change that takes place in you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, precious Heavenly Father, God, for this evening, God. Oh, Lord, this is not one of my favorite things to preach about, but I feel, I believe that it, I don't live by feelings. I meant to say believe. I believe, God, that it has, to, it has to happen. People have to know. People have to hear. God, there's just so much. So much is at stake. Eternity is at stake for the souls of people. Eternity is at stake, Father. God, help us all, Father God. God, give us all a hunger to do Thy will, God. Give us a, a desire, Father God, to move forward, Father God. Give, give any, any, anybody who's listening to this, Father God, who's religiously lost, Father God, move in their hearts so that they're born again. Father God, that the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside them, resurrects their spirit, washes them with regeneration, Father God. And that they can go forward, Father God, and at the end of their life, or when Jesus comes back, they can be saved. And I thank you for it in advance, Father God. Careful to give you the glory, Father God, because I deserve no glory of my own. Father, I want people saved, God. I want sinners to come to Christ, but I want them to come on what the Bible says, not, not to come and just get religious and be, still, be, still be lost. God, I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen.